Before we start, I just want to put on record, I don't store my mic where Karan Johar does. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Can I hit you how with my I, car? <laughs> how I wonder what you are. Before I begin, I have to make a disclosure. I feel very connected to Twinkle. Her mother, Dimple, and I shared for a brief period the same school right down the road here, St. Joseph's Convent, Bandra. And there are some people who just capture the imagination of the people around them, and Dimple was one. Kumpal or Simple was the other. Your grandfather, Chuni Bhai, your grandmother, Betty. I know where the craziness comes from, the wild, zany side. So I'm going to proceed in a very, um, I, know the I know the family. Anju Mahendru was my cousin. We met your father many times. Where was this lady who writes these incredibly humane, compassionate, observant books how did, she, how did she become? What was she doing all these years? So, um, I think uh, I, I call her Auntie M, so I'm going to continue. Though I she, insist that yeah. you call me Auntie M. <laughs> and um, the strange thing is, um, I think I've always been a reader since I was young. And, um, once we had a conversation where uh, she called me. Who is she? You. I and, called you. Uh, you yeah. called me and you said, you know, um, I know your father very well and he used to I call didn't say me. It very well. He used to call <laughs> me very often late at night and just I was wondering whether she's going to say I was the love of his life and you have a stepbrother somewhere. She said um, he was a big reader and we used to discuss books. And uh, it brought Rajesh back. Khanna used to discuss books passionately, late yeah. at night, and you dedicated your first book to him. Yes. And uh, so I think my, uh, my father was a very big reader in our household. It was just something that we did. I know it doesn't fit with uh, what people think Bollywood normally does, but uh, that, was, that was our household, and that's where we are from. So... Um, but I everybody who, do who reads does not write and then does not write these incredibly, it's small town India. It's an India which we never dream would be uh, visible to somebody born in one of the most glamorous homes in the country and married to a very glamorous star. So does this mean that you were struggling to keep that girl inside, that observant, sensitive girl? I don't know about observant and sensitive because while growing up, nobody said you're observant and sensitive. Sensitive. They just said you're weird. And uh, you're today weird. 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 Okay. And uh, today the same people seem to think that uh, that weirdness is wisdom. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering whether they are weird. But um, I would say that. So when I was young, I was writing a book. I wrote half a book uh, when I was about 18. I had a file of morbid poems, and. Um, and that was it. And then for 20 years, I didn't write a word. I didn't write a diary entry. I, I wrote nothing. Why? I just didn't. I, I was busy with doing what I needed to do in life. And uh, I thought I would write when I was 60, but then this opportunity came. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a friend of mine shifted from a newspaper to another paper. And she said, will you write a column? Give credit where credit is Sarita due. Sarita Tanwar. She exactly. hates it because she says, please, can you stop telling people and, and I don't want any more credit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it all began. And, and that's how I'm here. What do you think your father would have made of your writing? <laughs> so, my father used to believe in astrology. And he had an astrologer, Bharat, who kept telling him that your daughter will be a big writer someday. So he would keep nagging me. And I didn't write a word till he passed away. So I just wish that he could see me now. And that's all. You know, Twinkle, we're supposed to make this funny and lively. Yes. And, and you're yeah, so funny and lively. That was supposed lively. to be, yeah, the plan. But I just want to say that you're a fabulous writer. Thank you. 
and I want to read some special passages, not the ones of so much humor, but the ones where you've described somebody tying the pleats of her sari, somebody, a very shy man holding onto the rail so he doesn't nudge against a lady on a rickshaw. These are those sensitive things that uh, you hardly expect somebody who's been brought up. Unfortunately, we have stereotypes. And somebody like that, but your greatest book is going to be about your father. It'll not be a book I'll ever write. But um, so I think that um, mm. a book like this, when you write in The Legend of Lakshmi Prasad, I had to do a lot of research because it's not my world. So for example, um, I have you know, diaries filled with little details. I wanted to know if the train is stopping, uh, you know, on the way to Uttarakhand at Vikram Nagar station. How long does it really stop for? Is it so 10 minutes? So who did minutes? you ask? I looked up railway schedules. I interviewed lots of people like uh, Arunachala uh, Muruganathan. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed yeah. him. I interviewed doctors because I wanted to know what the ICU was like in the 80s. And uh, they would tell me things like they had an oxygen pipe at that time and not a mask. Um, which I put into the book, but my copy editor said it just doesn't sound right, so I had to remove it anyway. And doing all of this, I think uh, I have a brain that's filled with useless information, even because I write columns. So for example, I'm the only person on earth, I think, who knows that uh, Lahore is 412 kilometers from Delhi, because I wanted to write a column where instead of sending the Indian army, I wanted Kejriwal to divert all the mosquitoes there to attack them instead. So. <laughs> so in another life, you would have been an excellent fact checker yeah. at a newspaper office. I think so. What on earth does Akshay do when you're researching the miles between Lahore and God knows where? Hey, he's watching. What does that poor man do? He's watching <laughs> cricket, <laughs> which is fine. And like it came in my column once, he called me, come for dinner. And I said, no, no, I'm looking for a picture of Leander Pay's nipples. <laughs> and I was for the Times of India. So yeah, he's used to it. You know, the interesting thing about uh, this relationship, what we see about, between you and Akshay, is the fact that he seems to have blossomed and evolved ever since you have started writing. Or maybe we're looking at him in a way that says, if he goes home every evening to a woman with such humor, with such biting wit, he's not the Akshay that we thought he was. Do you see our confusion now? We didn't see him as, we saw this person who did Kilari and you know. But I don't really the, care what other people, the way they look at him, it's, it's true. not how I look at but him. But he has, in a way, in the film industry, it's very patriarchal. Uh -huh. He has benefited and basked in a lot of your blossoming. Does he know that? If he doesn't, I'll tell him today for sure. <laughs> He'll hear it. Um, so what I'd love you to do is, you pick your favorite passage from the book and read it, and then I'll pick my favorite and read a small paragraph. I'd like, has everybody in the audience read it? Has How everybody? many people have read it? Okay. That's it, please read it. It's a gentle, humorous, almost pastoral. And how many people read Mrs. Funny Bones? Oh God, okay. <laughs> so now this, this is the one, but I'm going to ask Twinkle to read a bit from the book. Your favorite. So I'm reading from uh, a story called Salam Noni Apa. And as it happens, the person who inspired the protagonist is sitting somewhere in this audience. And we won't say who, but she's somewhere there. Uh, this, and this is the part where Noni Appa and Binni, who are in their late 60s, they're both widows, um, and Noni Appa's daughter comes back from England. In the first week of January, Malika came to visit Noni Appa from London. She got her mother and aunt a suitcase filled with imported goodies, chocolates, perfume, hair dye, and of course, the one thing that every Indian woman pesters her NRI relatives for, undergarments from Marks and Spencer. Binny eagerly took the coveted items from Malika and dramatically declared, these British are really third-rate people, I tell you. Their only saving grace lies in their first-rate bras. Their balcony-style marks and sparks give such good support and pushes everything properly in place, straight from basement level to perfect third-floor height. 
That Friday, Binni dragged Malika to the Jamaat Khana, hoping some nice Ismaili boy would prostrate himself at her feet. In the car, Binni was chuckling away. Malla, you know, when your father passed away, Appa was not that old, just close to 50. She would go to the Jamaat Khana in her tightly draped sari and her pink lipstick. Noni Appa interrupted. Again this story, Binni, how many times? Binni laughed and ignoring her sister's protest, continued. Are, let me say what I want. Ha! Huh. So all the men in the Jamaat Khana would look at her and keep trying to say, Yali Madat, Yali Madat. And then when they would go completely out of control, they would find sources too. Malika giggled. What does out of control mean, Binni Masi? What would they do? Explode in their pants? And Noni Appa, horrified, almost banged into the auto rickshaw that had suddenly halted in front of her. Chi, not dirty like that. They would send proposal, that's all. And after that, your mother, always such a prude with her constant, no, Binni, I don't want to get a bad reputation, would never even greet them back, said a giggling Binni. But I think things have changed. If you really want to know what out of control is, Malla, then you have to look at your mother. These days, she's panting all over that yoga teacher, her boyfriend, Ananji. And imitating her sister with a wobbly falsetto voice, Binni continued, Ananji, have a whiskey today. The weather is perfect for it turning that poor vegetarian gujubai to an alcoholic, that also on my whiskey. Malika exclaimed, Mom, you didn't tell me all this. Noni Appa, wanting to strangle her sister, said, Ya Allah, it's nothing like that. Yes, I offered him a drink, and so sometimes he has one now when we play. Your Masi hates cards, so what should I do? Keep playing by myself. But the good-natured ribbing in the car didn't stop. And since Noni Appa could not turn her hearing aid off while driving, she just had to bear with her family, her eyebrows raised in exasperation, shaking her head at their sly digs. Lovely. You said you read a lot as a child. What did you read and at what stages? So I, I think I, by the time I was in my teens, I was reading science fiction. I had this uncle who had cartons full of these old novels and comics and... Uncle from your dad's side or mom's? mom's side. Mom's side, okay. And I read all of this and why I'm saying that it's important to read because you have to fill your head with words. It's like, um, you know, you want juice and if you take a mixer grinder and start an empty one and go, rrr, 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 what's going to come out? So you need to put some tomatoes or carrots and apples and stuff. The same way, if you have enough books in your head and words, and then you put the mixie and go, rrr, rrr, something worthwhile may come out. Rrr, rrr. What's yes, that rrr, sound? Rrr. <laughs> That's what it makes. <laughs> what are you reading now? Uh, I've just started reading The Sellout by okay, Paul Beatty. Yeah. Okay. You tend to read more uh, books of fiction or non-fiction? I only read non. I, I only read fiction. I you don't read, read non-fiction. No. Okay, in the book uh, of uh, non-fiction that you did, there were so many wonderful, Mrs. Funny Bones, there were so many wonderful references to your mother-in-law, your family, and doesn't she mind? No, and people keep asking me that, and I asked her once, I said, you know, do people say anything? And she just said, she said that, uh, I'm really proud of you. And wow. that was it. And my heart, you know, melted into a puddle of ghee. So, yeah. That's excellent. No pressure from your film community, Akshay's side, uh, to rein in, to pull the punches, to watch what you say? No, they're very happy. They're like, she's writing at least and saying all this. Uh, otherwise, I was going in parties and telling people all this nonsense. So, you know, they're like, thank God we're saved. Have people's attitudes towards you changed? It, ever since you've become this high-profile columnist and author in, the, in your community? I have uh, very few close friends. So they have known me and they, uh, you know, I had uh, one of my oldest friends, he said, uh, hai, hai. So I was like, okay, I mean, you know, that's a compliment, I guess. <laughs> so, um, no, but by and large, it's been pretty much the same. Yeah. I'm still curious about what made you this person. You know, being a star, ch star child, an actress yourself, the wife of a star, there's, there's a whole surge of humanity that thrusts itself against, you know, against celebrity. People rub up against your car window. They want to be introduced to you at parties. There's a whole, more than most people. In India, we're obsessed with stars. 
we don't realize that sometimes they're looking back at us. It's like looking at the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa is actually looking it back at you and um, observing all the nuances, the foibles. Now, you get that a lot. Lots of people rub up against you, metaphorically, obviously. Some, uh, some of them not so metaphorically. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, so you have the opportunity to see so much. Do you see human nature at its worst? or its best? I actually don't have as much opportunity as I would like. Because when everyone's looking at you, uh, it's like, you know, there's a bear, there's a gorilla, there's Twinkle in that cage. So you can't really look at people. But uh, I spend most of my life, perhaps because I was born in this uh, limelight, uh, trying to just be normal. That was my biggest thing. I think that is your biggest achievement, besides writing so well. I tried very yeah, hard. Yeah. Because it's a crazy, it's a crazy life. I mean, Bollywood is, uh, uh, and you probably had the craziest of it. Do you think boarding school saved you or being away from home? So what I'd like to say is that very often we look back and uh, we think, and we realize that the worst thing that ever happened to us, or at that point what we thought was the worst thing that ever happened to us, is probably the best thing. I remember going to boarding school and I Old. was, I was, uh, I was in the sixth grade. So about and 12? Yeah, 12. about that. And when I was in the fifth grade in Manikji Cooper, I was, you know, in a class of 36, 37, I was probably second last. I was a lazy, complacent child. And fat. A and fat. That, that hasn't changed too much, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went to boarding school, Suddenly, I was left to my own devices for the first time in my life. I had to fend for myself. This is the one that you made Karan Johar roll down a hill from in Panchkani. Well, if he would have lasted, then uh, <laughs> he would have been even, uh, you know, greater than he is now. Mm. But um, so I went there and I discovered this drive within myself. I uh, topped my class that year. I came first in sixth standard, which was almost a miracle. Your parents must have been horrified. They were hor They didn't care. And I would keep coming and telling them, Mom, I'm doing so well in school. I, I remember in the 10th grade board exam, CBSE, I got 97 in maths. I went and told my mother I got 97. She's like, you weigh 97 kilos, lose some weight. <laughs> I was like, what is this? I mean, you know, so we had a different family where this was not appreciated. I know, I know. It's a big joke, education in most, uh, sorry, Bollywood homes. <laughs> Nobody knows where the kids go to school. Nobody knows how they're doing. No, but it was the same thing. My sister was also the same. So she also really tried hard and she would also be in the but top five. she went five. to boarding also? Yeah. So I think once we went there, we were, you know, we had to stand on our own feet and that was the best thing that ever happened to us. And you lasted in one boarding school or you were... No, I was there. I was there till I finished my 10th, came back, went to college in Bombay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's said that great writers are... Um, usually burnished in the crucible of human existence through pain and hardship, because that gives rise to their compassion. You cannot write about people without feeling compassion for them in some, on some level. I know that your mother's family has had enormous tragedy. Your grandmother has lost three of her four children. Is this what do you think, is this what gave you this compassion, this caring for human, human nature, just human beings? I, um, so I just like to say I grew up with all of them in one house. And it was, I don't know about what, what contributed. I haven't really analyzed myself. I've never really been to a shrink, and I don't know these things. I think it was a wonderful way to grow up because all my aunts and uncles, and some of who are, all of them actually are no more, uh, we lived like gypsies, so all of them were doing something. My uncle would uh, make ink sketches. My aunt would write bad poetry like me. My other aunt would paint. Which ream or simple? Ream. Okay. So we were always doing something. In, in our house, we all know how to paint a little. We can all crochet, knit, write, and, and do things like that. So it was just a wonderful way of, of growing up. Can I tell you a quick little story? There was a girl in our class called Usha Venkatesh who was very bossy. And she'd lent your mum a Secret 7 Enid Blyton book. And your mum hadn't returned it for very long. And Usha was this horrible type who would go on and on and on. And once 
landed up at your home. At that time, it was in at Gorbandar Road, not your home, your mom's home. And the reason why your mom hadn't been able to return the book was, Usha says that she got there and she found your grandfather reading the book. Possible. <laughs> it's really possible, yeah. So, um, what is your opinion of... Look, I've seen a lot of ideological um, stances in your book. There's one in which you describe this, the most edifying of all the stories is on the sanitary pad uh, fable, which is so brilliantly done. But even there, you are propagating a way of life. You say that, um, you know, this Murug, the man who is uh, making these sanitary pads, he gives a lecture at, uh, at some great IIT conference or Unilever conference. And he says, big corporations, what, say that. So this is actually uh, Muruga's philosophy itself. He says, uh, big corporations, they are like uh, mosquitoes. They're like parasites. And uh, they suck blood, they spread illness. Whereas his way of doing business, which is social entrepreneurship, is like a honeybee. You uh, take nectar, but you help society, you, and you pollinate uh, things. And I think it was, when I came across this story, I thought it was a very important story. There was this man. See, when women talk about feminism and taboos, it's, it's fine, people nod. But here there was this man from a very simple background who tirelessly, and uh, you know, where the world was against him, society, his family, he went on to make a cheap sanitary pad and a cheap sanitary pad making machine. And I also think that there are a lot of taboos and, you know, we kind of uh, treat things as very uh, sacred or, 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 or there are lots of myths around it, which puts women at a disadvantage. There's a temple right next to my house. It has a board. Menstruating women are not allowed. So all of these things uh, need to get dispelled. It's, it's a world we live in. These are bodily functions and uh, we just have to take it in our stride. You, you came from a very liberal, um, almost eccentric family from your mother's Idio side. Idiosyncratic is Idio a better word yeah, than eccentric. <laughs> yeah, but... Well, um, <laughs> what did you gain from your father's side? I haven't really looked at my past. And I think that looking at, the, at your past, literally, and it's a line in my book, I don't want to choke on the dust from my footsteps. So let's move on. Okay. Um, the most beautiful line in, amongst many in the book is how she introduces this gentle love affair between the man who invents the sanitary towel and Sarita, the woman from a small town who teaches him English. And I will read that paragraph. Babu Kevat was standing in the doorway Bablu Kevat, that's his name, the man who makes a sanitary towel. In the months that he had been coming to her for English lessons, she had always been dressed in a simple salwar kameez, her wavy hair in a single plait, and her reading glasses firmly perched on her nose or sometimes pushed on her head like a hairband. Seeing her dressed in a sari, he blurted out in his still tottering English, Sarita ji, I went out of town for some days and you are fully changed. Very tip-top today. You are looking very nice. Sarita replied with a frown. Prabhash, this isn't quite right. Bablu felt his cheeks flush with embarrassment, worried that perhaps he had been too forward. Then she laughed. Where do I even begin with a fully charged? fully changed and tip-top. But I must say, the you are looking very nice part was perfect. And just like that, his lessons had begun before he had even entered the shabby apartment. Such a subtle way of bringing in these two. She was teaching him more than English. She was teaching him the language of love. Beautiful. What is your opinion of your contemporaries? You started in films around 80, mid-80s? 
Who were your contemporaries at that time, the girls who entered the film industry? I don't know. I don't even think about them anymore. <laughs> what do you think of today's women? If you could, you were an actress who gave up, who, were not, who was not very successful. Imagine if you hadn't been given this opportunity to express yourself. We would have never known. You would have never written books or columns. There must be so much, so many others who have not had this chance. Do you think that we do not do enough justice to the film industry and give them its due and think these are thinking people, these are uh, people who uh, have more to them than just being pretty faces? I mean, uh, the film industry, like any other business, like journalism, there are some smart people, some very dumb people. In the movie business, there are some smart people, some very dumb people. Who are and the smart people? Well, I know many smart people. I know many dumb people as well. Names. <laughs> uh, I would say Amir Khan is smart. I would say... Kangana? Uh, I don't know her at all. I, I, From her public pronouncements? So. I, I don't know her at all, so I can't really say. Why, why is it in the film industry that feminism is considered to be a taboo word amongst a few actresses? It's not I mean, just in the film industry. I would like to say that uh, a lot of people have this misconception about feminism. Uh, they feel that feminists uh, have, uh, you know, are, are very aggressive, man-hating women with a little mustache. Um, it's not true. I think it's got a bad rap because probably at the time when feminism came into being, you had to be rather strident and aggressive because you were facing so much opposition. But that is not the case today. And like I've said a million times, feminism is about equality, gender equality. It's not about gender neutrality, it's about equality. And anybody who doesn't agree with that would be a bit of an idiot. True. Hmm. Let's come to Akshay. He is one hell of a proud husband, somebody who is uh, totally supportive, etc. What are the areas of difference where do you feel that intellectually uh, you are on the same level? Do you feel that he reads the same books? He doesn't and read. does it matter? He doesn't read and he's the only person I can say that, you know, I always say you, you need to read, you need to be, to be smart or to be successful. He doesn't read, so he's a very bad role model for bookshops because despite that, he's really smart. He's smart in a different way than I am. I'm probably uh, better read, but he is street smart. He is, uh, in fact, he's better with numbers than I am. He is, um, his understanding of people, his understanding of the way business works, uh, is greater than me. But so he's how, obviously a very confident man in his and, own skin. And he's extremely confident in his skin. But how do we even define what smartness is? Earlier you used to have, uh, you know, IQ tests and things like that. You can't define smartness. It's just the ability to do what you want to do really well. And that's all smartness is. Besides Amir, who else would you say is smart? Is in this the a quiz about the film industry or is it about my book, Auntie M? <laughs> come back. <laughs> You know, everybody talks about your book so much and there will be many opportunities, but I don't know how many opportunities to really get you to, to find out because you fascinate so many people. How has this person arrived with so much to say and who says it so well? So, I'm, you know, this is for myself also. How does Twinkle... Um, plan her day. I mean, you're still doing your interior business. How much time do, goes there? So not as much as I used to. Um, now I have a little one. I have a four-year-old. And um, I'd like, I prefer doing fewer things and doing things from home. So I just take one or two projects a year. Earlier, I would do 11. Uh, you I would get do up what? 11 projects a year. A year. Okay. Now I don't. Okay. And I get up really early. Um, it seems very odd, but I get up, my husband gets up by five. I get up by six. And by 12, I've actually finished half my day's work. Uh, but did nobody else instill, is awake. Did he instill discipl that discipline in you? Nobody can instill anything in me. I was born like this. My mother complains that by 8.30, I wanted to sleep when I was single, <laughs> which didn't really leave much time for romance because, you know, where was I going on a date? I was like asleep. Um, but uh, having said that, I, and I, I do one task at a time meticulously. And I also uh, feel... Uh, 
I accept the fact that I'm going to be guilty about many, many things, and I can't do everything perfectly. And um, I go through phases of when I focus completely on one task and then I jump to the other. Are you driven? Extremely. Ah, okay. You must be. <laughs> You're doing um, a column a week. Yeah. Uh, Are you working on a weeks. book now? Not yet. I, my editor said that I need to take some time off from Jan because after I finished this, I started getting lost. It's like, you know, when, you, when you're writing a book, um, you have imaginary playmates when you're a kid, and now you have reason to play with your imaginary playmates. It's like that. And then when it's all finished, you are lonely. True, true. Yeah. I'm going to open this out to the audience. There's going to be lots of questions. Um, there. But there should be only questions, please. Not long statements of, uh, you know, declamations and stuff questions and say your name if you can. But is there, a, is there a mic in the audience? Is there a mic? Yeah, please. The gentleman here. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, okay. Nice to hear and read you, Twinkle. Uh, I have a very specific question for you. I read somewhere you said you need to find a, you need to find a definite and specific voice of your own uh, to write. How did you find your own? And uh, one question voice. for you, ma'am. When we are talking about feminism, why are we still asking questions like, what, did your what would your father think about you as a writer? What does your husband think about your writer? How, how relevant is that? As a journalist, one is curious. No, I don't, think, I don't, think, I don't think it was yeah. about patriarchy. Yeah. She was asking me about my family, what my yeah. family thinks, probably. Uh, the other thing, as a voice, uh, it, like I've said, a voice has to be distinctive. It has to be uniquely yours. How you create it is a mystery. And if that was something that you know, could be taught, then lots of people would be rather well known. But like I said, if you want to write, you need to read incessantly. You need to write every day. You need to eat carbohydrates. People who eat protein and then pretend that their brain is functioning at full level are deluding themselves. Eat carbohydrates. Potatoes. <laughs> yeah, potatoes or roti or whatever it is, but you need to eat. And, um, and if you go on writing, you'll find your voice. It's there somewhere because you're unique, so your voice will be unique. Excellent. Anybody else? Hi, Twinkle. This is right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't see you. Right here. Ah, okay. Hi, uh, ah. this is Naresh Chainani. Uh, you've been very honest and upfront uh, from the very beginning and said that you didn't belong to the acting school and movies, right? Now, my question to you is that you said because you didn't belong there because you could hardly act. I, I heard you say that. And I, uh, now, when you were, and this question that was asked to you about your contemporaries, you, you dug it. And what I want to know from you is that when you were working, you know, the, during that period with your contemporaries, did you realize that you, you don't belong there because you have this wacky sense of humor, your one-liners, not only the wacky sense of humor, but you, you, you couldn't relate to them. Did you realize that? So, um, I don't know about relating to them, but I would always say strange things. I remember very rarely in life, I came late once on the set, and my co-actor said, oh, you know, you've come late. And I said, why, what will the producer do? Is he going to stab me? He'll tie me up in a room. And he said, yeah, you know, he works with Dawood. So I was like, oh, shit. So, yeah, I don't think that uh, my penchant for just uh, opening my mouth did help me greatly at that point. One question here, please. Uh, any failures, setbacks, defeats in life that you'd like to tell us about, which will inspire us? My defeats are on celluloid. Watch them. <laughs> and and in, your, in your writing life? Uh, what goes through your mind when... Here. What goes through your mind before releasing of, the, of your book? And whether will uh, I get uh, autograph on your first book I have right away? Uh, if you send your book, I'll give you an autograph. What goes through my mind? I'm supposed to feel elated, but I actually feel lost. That's what goes through my mind. And then I've done the best I can. So beyond that, it's up to people whether they like it or they're not. But are you feeling lost now? No, it's been a month. I'm, okay. I've recovered. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Twink the lady here. Twinkle, what's your fear, biggest fear as a writer? Where are you? Can you... Yeah. Ah, there. Okay. My biggest fear uh, is, um, I think probably that I'll be skipping genres. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And I just hope that my readers come along with me. 
I, I mean, I might do a dystopian, you know, India future book next. Not so Animal Farm. I just hope that... Not Animal Farm. <laughs> well, my daughter likes Peppa Pig, so maybe she'll write the second Animal Farm, <laughs> where Peppa Pig kills everybody. But yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my fear. Hi. My mom made me read your um, column on red lipstick. I thought it was beautiful. But you always, you always, that was really intense and beautiful at the same time. But you have a, it's, you have a sense of humor which comes naturally to you. How do you get that? Is that how you are in normal life and that just transforms in your columns and your books? Or? Your family. But uh, it's just, it's very natural. It's like, it's almost like I've seen that and you made me laugh at something that I already know. But it's just funny at the same time. So, humor is nothing else but the intrinsic truth seen from a peculiarly slanted magnifying glass. There's nothing twinkle, else to it. Is that a twinkle coat? It is. Good. <laughs> and uh, I find the funny in everything. For example, on my way here, and I don't think anything is taboo. On my way here, uh, just before that I had to stop at a brunch, a family friend's brunch. Mr. Vinnie Jain was also there. And there was a theme. It was hints of red. Hints of red. Hints of red. Now, what kind of a theme is hints of red? Either you have, you know, vampires or ghosts, or you have cowboys and cows. Hints of red. And um, he's also wearing blue, and I was dressed exactly like this. So when somebody came and asked me, uh, where's the, your red? I said, I can take out my pad, red. <laughs> and I really don't care <laughs> so, beyond that. So I don't think anything is sacred in that way. A very politically incorrect joke now that we're I talking don't care. about... <laughs> How do you know that your bartender is really angry with you? Your Bloody Mary comes with a string attached. Okay, that's even worse. <laughs> well, now that we're writing about sanitary, no. Okay, any more questions? Hi, um, um, yeah. over here. Uh, this is Saurav here. So, uh, your book is currently three, ranked number three on Amazon. It's number two. Oh, Let okay. me correct Okay, it's you. number two. Yes. But uh, number one is uh, Mr. Chetan Bhagat, and you, personally, I feel you write way better than him. So do you think a, a novelist who's a woman can really be number one in India and in the world? It has nothing to do with being a woman. So let's not make that into a thing about feminism. Every year, this is the second year, Mr. Bhagat is standing there and I am right, you know, touching his backside, standing behind him at number two. Uh, obviously, people seem to like what he's writing, and in, in an age where bookshops are shutting down, I just say that, thank God, people are at least reading. So that's all. Okay, can I speak something? Yes. Yeah. I want to know one thing. You said, I agree with you that reading Hello. is very good. Hello. And sometimes when we read something, we tend to develop that style of writing. Yet. I mean, you're discussing feminism and something which comes from within you, which is original. Many may not believe in that, but you feel, strongly feel that it's original. So do you think your original thoughts can be influenced by what you're reading? Like humor is also something, what you talk about, it comes to people naturally. Like standing here, I mean, I can understand because at times I also come out with some unique liners. And it just Can you tell us like, one? Like one. Please tell us Please one. Tell no, us I, one. I, I won't be able to tell you instantly. Like, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, how do I put it? Like, uh, uh, I was telling somebody, pen is mightier than sword. When and is then, pen is mightier than pen sword? Is my, pen is mightier than sword. And then suddenly, you know, they said, come again. And I said, pen is mightier than sword. So you joined the first two words, basically. Yeah, so okay. it was something which comes and it just comes without... Excellent. It's just... Uh, I like your line. I, I probably use that <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I better get that copyrighted. But tell me, how do you get yourself into an original... Reading others but still being keeping that unique part of you, original. We are all original. Most of us just pretending to fit into this world. Nobody fits in. We are all original. That's it. On that note, uh, some more. Do we have time for? Okay, please. Oh, she asked a question on the first day also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The mic. Uh, hi. Can I? 
Yeah, yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, first of all, thank you very much for taking up to literature. Now we have a beautiful Indian Wonder Woman to look up to. So my question is, how to become Mrs. Funny Bones, who is such a vivacious khiladi of words, wit, energy, and humor? How how to become Mrs. Funny Bones? Any recipe? You can't become Mrs. Funny Bones. You can be you. How will you become somebody else? And if you try, you'll fail. Just be you. See what's on. You know what are the what is the uh, things that define you? Find them. You don't have to be anybody else. I didn't try to be someone else. Any, but if we get inspired by Mrs. Funny Bones, so then be inspired to find your own path. That's what you need to know. On that note, uh, I want yeah. to say that her book is full of quirky, idiosyncratic characters who will delight, madden. Um, engage, uh, fascinate you, please go out and buy The Legend of Lakshmi Prasad. Do we have any more time for questions? Everybody Man, wants to, okay. Uh, yeah. Just one question, Ms. Kanna. Um, what is your take on the Harry Potter books? Because I'll tell you what, when my kids were small, they hated them, they found them dark, frightening and when I read it also personally as a mother I found that they were just not right for eight and ten year olds so what is your take I'm a big Harry Potter fan <laughs> in fact I was reading one and I actually uh, you've got a neck sprain and my neck got stuck like this so yeah please don't I love Harry Potter and Harry Potter, Potter also um, I think the session should be over now we've run out of time one last question last Here. Uh, Rachna Dubey here. Ma'am, uh, I wanted to know, I mean, I'm a mother, I have a four and a half year old also, so I want to know what kind of books do you think we should introduce our four year olds to? Because sometimes it's so confusing to pick that first book, you get that wrong, you've got your child off books completely right from the word go. Uh, I would recommend Witch on a Broom, Room on a Broom, it's about a witch by Julia Donaldson. It's about a witch and it's about how it's cool to be a witch and how it's cool to have powers. It has nothing to do with being a princess. It has nothing to do with how you look. It's just about your abilities. So I think I would recommend that. Now we're going to get on our broomsticks and fly yes. away. Thank you, everybody, Thank for this you. session. Bye.